I'm someone who consumes a lot of media. I'm always curious about indulging in the ever-expanding world of movies, video games, shows, books, etc. But there's so much, and it makes it so hard to see everything. I actually ran the numbers, and if from the moment you were born, you sat and watched movies without sleep for your entire life, you could just barely watch every film by the age of 92. Not including TV or anything to come out after that point. It's impossible, which should already be obvious in your minds, of course, but that lends you to thinking, well, if I can't see everything, then I guess I'll just have to see the best. Which is why we have things like the Oscars and the award shows to signify and show off these are the greats. Most of the time, like some, some, some fuck. Why we have critically acclaimed films and films passed down that are through Grapevine alone. Why Princess Bride is so well known and loved, even though it never won an award. It's just loved by the people, the cult classic films. So, what's the point in all this? I like having my balls kicked. Did you see my message? No, I didn't. I like having my balls kicked. I didn't get your message. I like being kicked in the balls. You get no bitches! Anime as a medium has things that are completely outside the realm of movies, especially Western films. Something different. It feels as if sometimes my mind opens when I see a new concept and amazing ideas told through this style of entertainment. Oh, hey guy, how's it going? Yeah, what's up? Cool, you look like a third grader. I am a fifth grader nigga! If you are familiar in the world of anime, its own little solar system, if you will, then you might have heard of the name Satoshi Khan. A brilliant film director who is, uh, but left us with some of the most notorious and well-known movies throughout the history of anime's lifespan. It's kind of like their 12 Angry Men. Well, maybe it's not as well known as something like Akira and not something new enough like Your Name. We have a discography of movies that left seeds in the anime industry that guided its way into what we know today. These movies end up being some of the most influential pieces of media in anime, but also for movies in general. For better or for worse. I sat down and wanted to watch all of his films. Luckily being about five of them, which makes it far easier to watch them all considering they aren't terribly long films and one is even a full length feature. And I get it. It doesn't sound impressive. Four and a half films in a weekend isn't that difficult. An entire man's life and legacy counted on one hand. But if you're only going to do that much before you kick the bucket, you better make it fucking worth it. Not much is really talked about in his early life. Just that up through high school, he was just like any of us. Just another kid who liked comics and anime and wished that he was in them. Spewing a love for animation, he dedicated himself to be an animator, going to college for it, where he would eventually become friends with Katsuhiro Otomo, creator of Akira! Now you may ask, how good of friends were they? That's... Why did I write that word so badly? How close were they really? No, that's not better. You may ask me... In 1995, compilation of three short films, the first and longest being written by, that's right, there he is, that's him, he's getting out there. Yeah, you've been tricked, I tricked you, 
This is a glorified review of all of his films. I, I'm even going to be here talking about them in a ranking order. But don't worry. Don't leave. We're, we're cool like that. Yeah, we're chill. You, you get it. You, you, it's fine. Subscribe and watch me rank movies. That'd be, like, awesome, in fact. That'd be so cool. That'd be, like, awesome. For a short film, this does a great job. And it gives you everything you need in the 45-minute span. Yeah, not that short, is it now? In a dystopian sci-fi future, we follow a few trash collectors. Doing the nitty-gritty space work the middle space class won't do when they stumble upon an SOS signal from an abandoned craft that replicates a huge manor. But just like Luigi's Mansion, a giant manor may look appealing, yet actually is haunted and just really a tech demo for the GameCube. Why did I write that? Uh, it's haunted! It's scary! The place is showing illusions of a woman who's already dead! What? Ooh. Well, if it's her, I guess, I guess, I guess it's all well. And like all sci-fi movies, AI is to blame. Which in like 1995 is like a good concept, but like nowadays, just hearing the word AI in chat GTP sends me on a spiral every time I have a teacher talk about it. The AI went rogue, it's evil, oh, it's oversaturated <laughs> concept. Then the best part happens where the computer's whole ordeal is that it wants people to stay. So it shows the main character memories. Oh, that's the name of the- Yeah, get them <笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> It shows his memories of his family and his daughter Emily. Now, obviously, our guy here is a family man, as we hear throughout the short, and can see how much he cares for his daughter. But he knows his daughter's already. That's just pain. That's just Emily. pain. That sucks. Emily. Like a siren calling to ships, this computer shows an ideal world of wishes and beauty that swallow you whole. The magnetic rose as it swallows up all of our characters in its beauty and allure. But just like a rose, the thorns will prick you away if you aren't careful.
honestly, for a short film, it's pretty impressive and is still a great piece to come out as a kind of debut work. And trust me, this talent did not go unnoticed. And as we'll see, he would spin afterwards a web of wondrous wooing silk that captures the audience. The first piece that caught my eye and I really wanted to see first is... I'm going to be honest, out of all of his movies, this one kind of sucks. <laughs> like, it really does. Uh, and I was looking forward to this movie. I was, I wanted to see it. Uh, I'm going to out myself. I watch Trash Taste. Yeah, yeah, go on, crucify me, do it. I'm not ashamed. I know who I am. But when Joey, the anime man, suggests this to be a fantastic film, very highly praised, ooh -hoo -hoo, I was very much looking forward to it. Oh boy, a, a real recommendation. <laughs> the whole movie follows our main character, Chiyoko, as she chases a lost love in hopes to reunite with a man who's a wanted refugee. She spends her whole life on this chase as we see this journey through the discography of films she's in as <laughs> the Millennium Actress. Now, the concept alone is a great idea. Oh, it creates some great visuals and moments in the film. But in my mind, you get the point very quickly and the charm is lost after it continues on this gimmick for an hour and a half. The very little progression that I feel is made through the film, even though it takes place through her entire life, ends up very belligerent. And it's probably due to the fact that Chiyoko, our main character, can only be summed up in wanting to chase this one guy, which she's done for her entire life. And it leads to feel that she has no depth of character, which Sucks because all of his other films are greatly known for their realistic and in-depth characters. So this one leads to heavy disappointment and truly can only be described as a slog to get through. The repeating scenario gets pretty old. I, I, I don't know. This one isn't worth my... What, what the fuck was that? Was, was that a little fucking rat that ran Did you guys see that? Did you guys see the fucking rat run across the screen? The repeating scenario gets pretty old. We go through a time period, she barely get a glimpse of the guy, and then she's saved by the dude that's interviewing her. It's it's pretty rinse and repeat, and it gets old. I'm tired of it. And it's just not worth a watch in my mind. Last time I take a recommendation from a podcast. 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 <laughs> Out of the discography of Satoshi Kon, this one is easily the black sheep of the family because it stands out as not a psychological mindfuck type movie and instead tells an understandable and cohesive storyline. Which is insane. Oh, I understand this film, zero stars on Letterbox, if you will. It also is kind of a hard movie to originally get into, especially when watching the rest of his discography, but this movie is surprisingly really well told. It's honestly an uplifting film about three homeless people who find an abandoned baby and try to return it to its mother. Now, I understand that that last sentence and uplifting don't typically fall together, but throughout the film itself and the little Christmas journey we are on, as 
the movie takes place on Christmas, we get a closer look into the background lives of our three homeless counterparts. And each backstory hits. And all of the pieces come back on this night. The personalities brought by each of the main cast work so well off each other, and each are an absolute delight to hear through the dialogue alone. They bounce off one another beautifully. The story has some darker elements to it, but honestly, it plays out almost in a way a Christmas-type tale would, where everything almost conveniently lays itself out, and coincidences lead to a happy ending, which is exactly what this movie needed. It might not be something aligned with his other films, but the reach that he shows in this film is great. And I could easily sit down and rewatch it, because it has such a good feeling attached to it. Every theme and character is built so well. So if you're feeling kind of down, or maybe it's approaching that snowy season, then this might be a really good pick to watch. Honestly, out of a lot of his movies, I sit back and think on this one extremely fondly. Sometimes it's just nice to have a happy ending. What the? Okay, yeah, finally! I knew I liked this movie from the start. It opens up with the. Oh, and there's the fucking... <laughs> Paprika, Paprika's Josa, she's all like... It's, it's awesome. I love dreams. As someone who sleeps daily, I'm very experienced in my dreaming. My dreams are wild. They like typically include at least, at least one cartoon character, an anime girl, in like a video game world, like it's some wacky ass plot. Like it's great. <laughs> my dreams are so goofy and stuff. Typically, someone like dies. It's like really gruesome and, and kind of scary. This movie kind of nails the absurd dreamism reality and is super impressive in its own right. This is the last film that Satoshi Kon did before he... This movie alone was set to have an effect on the creation of Inception, Christopher Nolan, oh, oh my god, Academy Award... This movie? Anime? In influenced the real world? Oh my god, mind bro. It's also a pretty easy story to follow. With all the wackiness happening, it's surprising. It hooks you really well, too, and keeps the ball rolling all the way through the film. Paprika is actually an alternate personality of this girl, who uses Paprika the same way Bruce Banner uses the Hulk. Except Paprika can do a bunch of wacky and cool shit and has men fawning over every fingernail. <sighs> Paprika being a part of a company that has found a way to intercept dreams in consciousness. Someone then taking the equipment and using it for terroristic actions. Fucking dream terrorism? Awesome! The dream psychology is done beautifully here because you can see in people's dreams a lot of the inner psyche each person possesses <laughs> in the way, you know, real dreams do. The way their inner mind mechanics are seen, and when they change the dreams, change alongside them as well. Besides, the visuals easily being a huge standout piece in this movie. Like I said, it 
isn't actually too complicated to follow, and the story is very straightforward, so you can just sit back and enjoy the ride. And, oh boy, what a ride it is! Paprika herself is such an interesting character, as well being very charismatic, boisterous, fun, charming, as an enacting counterpart to the real world self. The more we learn about each side of her, the deeper the scale goes, where Paprika is more than just a dream alternative, but a protection from insecurities and self-deprecation. A mask. A covering of the shadow. What Freud said or whatever. <laughs> I took Psychology 101, I know what I'm talking about. How do you know, Mama? When Paprika is unmasked, it's a pretty trying scene, yet it's done so well from a writing and creating standpoint. I think Satoshi easily took everything he learned in the past to make a movie that's so easily fun, digestible, and a good experience thoroughly. If there is one criticism that I would present the film, it's that Paprika ends up with this... She ends up with this guy? Th this? Oh... Uh. Hey look, it's uh, all of his old films. It's like a, a reference to himself as if he knew he'd die. Oh, what's that one? What's that one right there, you ask? <laughs> well, that's just... Perfect Blue was the first film Satoshi directed. This was the one he came out with, and it is easily his most infamous, well-known, and masterful film. I threw all the movies in kind of a ranking order for myself because, well, <laughs> that's who I am inside. And originally, I was not going to put Perfect Blue at the top. Along with my friends, I rewatched it for this video, and on the rewatch, the experience became so much more magical for me, which is why it's here. Perfect Blue is a top contender in anime movies for a good reason. There's a reason it has a top name in anime movie history. This movie is raw, it is confusing, it can be gross and unsettling. It is done so well. It's a shame that he came out of the works with his first movie being his defining film. Probably torturous to him. The story itself without the psychological or thriller elements alone is great. A girl whose career is shifting <sighs> A girl whose career is shifting from a pop idol to an actress and having to do everything she can just to get out there, no matter how hard it is. Now if you've seen this film, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but there's a very hard to watch, explicit few scenes that kind of uh, have that SA trigger, but, but it's acting. It's like acting for a film, so it's not real, but it still hurts and sucks to watch. Bring around the, the friends and family, pop this bad boy in, <laughs> oh, just see how awkward it gets. Perfect for a date night, women will love this one. Our protagonist, Mima, is experiencing a stalker who is seemingly following her every move every day. Mima appears to be losing it, and the psychological and thrill aspect then enters. Reality is unbeknownst to the viewer, not knowing what's real or not. If the stalker is actually there, if Mima is having dissociative episodes, is she killing people or is it someone else? 
everything is mixed up. Uh, your brain is blending like a smoothie. By the time the reveal occurs and the big climax takes place, you are utterly confused. The climax is great. It's an amazing sequence of events, and it's captivating. It's thrilling. And then you watch the credits roll and immediately have to go to look up a YouTube analysis video. Yeah, the movie's good. The turnaround twist is surprising, and the horror and psychological aspect is done great, but still, it wasn't anything that I deemed masterful. And I thought about this way for a long time. But upon rewatching the film, it... It all changes. Like knowing how a magic trick is done, you have a new appreciation for it. When the curtain is lifted, Perfect Blue upon rewatching is an entirely new experience, as you can firsthand see the way that Mima is affected by her surrounding characters and counterparts. The pieces begin to click. You catch the small details that pointed out the horrendous truth from the very beginning. It was all there already. But just like in real life, it isn't picked up on until it's too late. How people show signs that go below the radar, and when you see it all laid out in front of you, it was so obvious. Knowing when the train is going to leave the station and where the destination is, you can enjoy the ride of this film instead of sitting idle and confused. And that's the true inner workings of Perfect Blue. Why it's so renowned and consistently appears years after years on top of anime movies, the detail put into the film is done superbly. And even though most won't watch a movie just to immediately rewatch it, on that off chance, maybe years later, you do. It was built ready for you. A new experience with the film. The way you view this film is going to be entirely different, and that's what makes it a gorgeous piece of art. This is what would go to inspire creators like Guillermo del Toro and Darren Taranofsky, leading to the creation of, I don't know, Black Swan, Requiem for a Dream. From the moment Khan started, his effects would already splash waves in the movie world. It was perfect. Satoshi died before finishing his fifth film, Dreaming Machine, and nobody afterwards has been able to take on this insanity-inducing reclusivity of a film besides Khan himself, at least for the time being. His legacy is practically moot. Nothing left besides these five films. Yet, it isn't sad. In fact, almost the opposite. Khan worked to create every piece with as much mastery as possible. It's rare to see when someone's passion can emulate off of a piece of their work, but every single piece he's done was made with everything he had to keep pushing the limits of the creator, to keep pushing the boundaries of his own ideas, themes, and stories. If you're gonna make something, you might as well make it worthwhile. Give it everything. Don't stop. This will be better than the last. Who's insane now? Blood, sweat, and tears. This is gonna blow their minds. And it did. It mattered. None of it was in vain. He created and accomplished what so many wish they could do. The effect he created people strive for through their entire life. His works I can count on one hand. So, what's stopping you? <laughs>